Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. So I'm here to talk to you about optimization and ethics and organs. And this does go along very well with uh, Steve Boyd's talk last night, if you were there for it. It was very exciting, and he was talking about smart devices. But I'm going to talk about using optimization, the same technology, for allocating organs for transplantation. And sort of what are the lessons and what are the generalizations of that for the whole idea of rationing healthcare. I mean, just rationing healthcare, that sends people into a panic and, and a state. And, and so the, just the very idea that there should be any limit at all to the amount of money and the amount of resources that could be spent to provide more years of life or health to someone that we love is, is kind of, um, well, it's politically toxic. And so the question we might ask is, can we do something to cure scarcity? Or how can we help people understand how to deal with the ideas of rationing health care? So here's an example. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence in UK, the National Health Service, decided not to fund certain treatments that they considered to be not cost effective enough to be offered. And so they said that they wouldn't allow public funds to be spent on this new liver cancer drug because it costs 27,000 pounds per extra year of life. And uh, so the breast cancer drug Herceptin faced the same limit. And this actually upset voters so much that they ran the next election sort of on the issue of not allowing this kind of thing to happen. And, and if in the end, they caved and decided to fund those two drugs that were very expensive. So, but let's just talk about what does cost effectiveness mean when we, when we consider either public funding or any funding of, of treatments for healthcare. It's really a ratio that we're talking about. Someone, do I have a pointer? It's not showing up. Anyway, so if I look at the point, if I look at the ratio at the very bottom of this slide, I know it looks like it says cost T. It looks like that to me too, but that's the cost. Uh, we're talking about a ratio of the cost of some comparator treatment to the cost of, uh, minus the cost of the standard treatment. So in the numerator, we have how much more does a treatment cost, a new one, compared with, so I have to compare it to something else, which is usually whatever you would do if that treatment doesn't exist. And then in the denominator, you have QALY, that's quality adjusted life years. Sort of like how much longer will I live, but you, there's some adjustment if you're bedridden or you know having a very bad day that day. All right, so quality of quality adjusted life years that you expect to live from now under the new treatment minus under the standard treatment. Okay, so you got this ratio, and well, we can compare some examples. For instance, a, this high-intensity smoking relapse prevention program as compared with a low-intensity program. That is, you call the person more often and say, are you smoking? You have more group therapy sessions, et cetera, et cetera. So that is going to cost $190 per quality-adjusted life year. For every extra $190 you spend providing somebody more support, they'll live a one quality-adjusted life year longer. And so these range up to really out outrageous values, like $590,000 you can spend to give someone one year of life. And that's, for instance, screening all 65-year-olds for diabetes compared with the treatment of screening only the people who have hypertension. Okay. Uh, so those are examples of cost-effectiveness ratios. And there's two ways that the cost-effectiveness could be negative. And they're totally different. If the numerator is negative, then you're talking about the cost of the standard treatment, the cost of the new treatment is cheaper than the cost of the standard treatment. And the denominator being positive. So if the numerator is negative and the denominator is positive, then you're saving money and helping people. So this is like just a win-win and everyone cheers. And that's the things on the top of the slides, like. Um, cochlear implants in deaf children and colonoscopy screening, etc. So those things are great wins. If the cost effectiveness ratio is negative for the other reason, then you have a really bad treatment. So if the numerator is positive, it costs money, it costs more money to give you the new treatment and the denominator is negative, which means the treatment harms you, then that is a negative cost effectiveness ratio. And that's things like Doing surgery for, with a diagnosis of prostate cancer in older men is actually 
harms people and it costs more money. Uh, so, so, all right, so that's, that's basically the rundown of this. But it's important to notice that cost effectiveness is a really terrible tool for deciding what should we spend money on as a country for all of the people in the country. Cost effectiveness is actually about what treatment should I use for the person standing in front of me for the disease that they have. It doesn't really address issues of fairness among different people because the benefits accrue to different people. I'm going to go into that again. But of course, none of this information about cost effectiveness ratio sort of enters the discourse. I don't think she's thinking about cost effectiveness ratios. She's actually protesting, saying against the recommendation that mammograms not be performed in extremely low risk groups like women under 40. She thinks maybe that this decision is being driven by cost somehow, but it's not at all. In fact, mammograms for women under 40 are harmful to their health. So they have a negative cost effectiveness ratio uh, for that reason. But you know, so it's important to help people understand what we're talking about when we talk about rationing healthcare. But before all of this happened, and before there, was, there were the fights over the money provided for national health care, now there's the fight long ago about providing dialysis. And then when the very first dialysis center opened, they only had provision to provide dialysis for about seven people, and about 20 wanted to get dialysis in order to prevent them from dying from their kidney failure. This was the original death panel, if you've heard that term. They actually set up in, in Seattle, a community panel with people like a pastor and a homemaker and a business person to decide the social value of each of their applicants for that, for that dialysis. And um, they included questions like, well, how much does this person earn? And does this person have children that they're providing for? And it was a very difficult time. But of course, the reason that they had to make this decision is that they didn't have enough dialysis machines. And that was curable with more money. Well, they just eventually, Congress decided that anyone who has end stage renal disease, anyone who has kidney failure, qualifies for Medicare. So that means the US government pays for every one who was on dialysis in the US. And they sort of didn't realize how incredibly expensive this was going to be at the time. Uh, so here's someone hooked up to a dialysis machine. And of course, the other input is that stack of money down there. But it costs 80000 maybe $100,000 a year to keep someone alive on dialysis. That's because they're in the dialysis center several days a week. And this is a terrible way to live. You know, you're hooked up to the machine all day long, three days a week. And on the other days, you don't necessarily feel all that well. This is not a great treatment for end stage renal disease. Instead, a better treatment would be to get someone a transplant. But in transplant, of course, you need to have a healthy donor kidney to put into someone, and there are not enough of them to go around, not enough by far. There are 100,000 people on the waiting list in the United States trying to get a kidney. And in unlike the situation where people are marching in the streets demanding their expensive cancer drugs and demanding their mammograms, even though they're bad for them, it's clear to everyone that you can't just buy more healthy kidneys. So in transplant, for 60 years, we've been saying, there are a limited number of kidneys. How will we be able to allocate them in a way that is fair, in a way that is effective, so that we make the best use that we can out of these organs? And sort of, it, there isn't this, I have an infinite demand impulse. Of course, in general healthcare, there is also not infinite resources to be provided. Uh, so everything is really rationed, but it's easier to see that fact in transplant. So what have people done in transplant about allocation? So the first thing that most mathematicians or operations researchers like me jump to is, ah, well, we'll define the benefit of giving this organ to this person, and then we'll maximize the benefit. And that's something like the greatest good for the greatest number. So we're going to add together the amount of benefit that each person gets who gets a kidney and make that sum as large as possible. But um, there's a problem with using a utilitarian thing like this. And that would be, first, how do you know what values to add together? We could be maximizing the number of years of additional organ life that we get. But actually, that's a pretty terrible metric, because some people would have been able to live many years without getting an organ. 
So we can say, if I put this kidney into this young, healthy person, they'll live for another 50 years with it, but they didn't need a kidney transplant at all. OK, so we should actually maybe instead maximize this thing that I've got on the bottom here, transplant benefit. So the difference between how long you live if you get the transplant and how long you would live without it. So this is actually, what did you add to the person's life by giving them the kidney? It's a little bit harder to define, but that makes sense. And in other cases, it might mean that you want to minimize the number of people who die while they're waiting for a transplant. Uh, because there's this medical urgency idea. Let's just make sure we keep as many people alive as we can. So it gets a little complicated to define what do you mean by the benefit. But even worse than that is that if we used only benefit to define who gets an organ transplant, only young, rich, white people would get them. And that is not acceptable in the United States and probably anywhere else. OK, so only people with higher education uh, who don't have any other diseases other than their organ failure, et cetera, are only going to ever be able to get a transplant. So we start to say that you also must consider equity, fairness. But this is really difficult to define quantitatively. Does it mean that every person waiting for a transplant has an equal chance to get one? You could certainly argue, and many have, that we should have a lottery. Just put everyone's name in the hat who needs an organ, and and the first person drawn gets the next organ that's available. It is actually an equitable system, but it's really terrible from the perspective of getting the right organ to the right candidate at the right time. Or you could say, well, everybody who wants an organ, get in line. And when you get to the front of the line, then it's your turn. And there's a kidney there because that is mostly how kidneys are allocated in the United States. This is a very United States organ system centric view. But it, so in the US, there, there are a few adjustments. If you're a child under 18, you get extra points in that scheme because it's affecting your growth to have no kidney function, et cetera. But basically, for kidneys, you're waiting in line. And that kind of makes sense because you can wait in line because you can get dialysis until such time as you, there's an organ available for you. But for liver, which is the next case, there is no artificial liver support. So if you have liver failure, Depending on how severe your disease is, you will just die if you don't get a liver. And so there's a score called the MELD score, which is the Modeled End Stage Liver Disease Score. And the higher it is, the more likely you are to die in the next 90 days if you don't get an organ. So the transplant goes to the person who has the highest probability of dying. Uh, and we try to get the organ to the highest MELD person. And we could say that that's, um, that's fair because the other people will live long enough to have a chance to access a different organ. You know, and it's also a utilitarian judgment. So for liver, strangely enough, there doesn't seem to be very much conflict between the idea of the fairness metric that we want to use and the utility metric that we want to use. Of course, the system in the US is still very messed up. So I'll explain what's going wrong with the liver allocation system in a minute. All right, or you might want to say that Equity means there's no definable demographic group that's being disadvantaged. You can't say, well, this isn't fair to women. Because look, women make up 40% uh, of the transplant list. Therefore, they should get 40% of the organs. People over 70 get 35% you know, of the organs now. They have to get at least 35% of the organs after our allocation change. And actually, that is what sunk, this last uh, bullet point, is what sunk a proposal to allocate kidneys according to who would get the maximum life years benefit out of them. When they started to do this, they analyzed it and found that older people would be very disadvantaged by this metric. So if you're older, you maybe don't have as many years to live, and you can't accrue as many years of additional benefit. And the fact that this allocation system would have the effect of, tra of shifting transplants from older people to younger people wasn't acceptable. And so that, that proposal was completely thrown away. I have a lot of other interesting stories about that as well. But here's something we don't talk about a lot. How sure are we about all these predictions I've been suggesting? Let's figure out who is going to live, who's going to get the maximum benefit out of getting this transplant. What if we don't know? Uh, we have an example would be the C statistic, which is measuring the accuracy of paired comparisons for a metric. So it says, if I have these two people, the people person on the left and the patient on the right, and I estimate which one will get larger 
transplant benefit from a certain kidney, how likely is it that I'm right? All right? So how likely is it that I can distinguish the person on the left from the person on the right? And that's actually really important because if you don't have a, any ability to predict who's doing better, then your allocation algorithm is really capricious. You just happen to fall into this category. You don't really have higher transplant benefit, but by chance, you are going to get that organ. And it seems like we're back to a lottery system. So people are not willing to base allocation systems on something that has a low C, C statistic. So for example, the C statistic of MELD, that end stage liver disease score, for predicting whether you're going to die is really high. It's as high as 0.88 for different subgroups. So we're pretty darn sure that the person with a higher MELD score is going to die before the person with the lower MELD score. But for kidney, uh, we are actually really not very good at predicting that transplant benefit, and so we have a C-score somewhere around 0.61. That means only 60% of the time are we right in distinguishing whether the person on the left or the person on the right is going to get more benefit out of it. And if you get a C statistic less than 0.5, then you should just reverse your sense of your decision, right? Okay. So we have all of these concerns, and the question is, how can um, optimization help us make these decisions. Uh, yeah, I'll just go past this. Uh, this is just one more reminder of the fact that even interventions that are very cost effective may not be provided if the person who benefits is a disadvantaged group. So this is the example of it would cost a few cents per person to provide many years of quality adjusted life for children in Africa, but they don't get these vitamin supplements because they're just unlucky in, in place of birth. All right. So how can I use optimization to inform the way we are allocating organs? Well, here's an example of allocating liver allocation. And this is the thing that I've been devoting a lot of my attention to rec uh, recently. The colored groups are what are called donor service areas. So inside the DSA, that's the organization that basically collects deceased donor um, organs and delivers them to the people who need them. And so the country's broken up into about 58 of these DSAs. And right now, the liver goes to the person in your DSA with the highest MELD score. So that isn't very fair, actually, because in different DSAs, you have a very different balance of need and supply. So in some DSAs, if you are very, very sick, you still won't be able to have access to a liver. But you might be, right, in San Diego, uh, you might be in the yellow region, which is where Los Angeles is. They have the worst problem in the country right now. If you are waiting for an organ and you have a meld of 35, which is very high, you won't be able to get a liver that becomes available in San Diego. Instead, it goes to someone in San Diego who only has a meld of 25. Even though it would have been possible to ship that liver, right? But we can't say, let's send a liver to the person with the highest meld in the whole country because that's too long for it to be out of the body. So you gotta have some sort of idea of local allocation. So how do we do that? Well, the Department of Health and Human Services says you absolutely are not allowed to have place of residence be a determining factor of access to a transplant. That was in 1998, and no one has fixed the geographic disparity problem yet in the United States. But we have a lot of hope that actually it's going to be mathematics that makes the difference. Uh, so the DSAs are organized into bigger groups called regions. And one of the proposals was, hey, let's just allocate organs to the sickest person in the region. Instead of the sickest person in my DSA, we'll send it to the sickest person in the whole region. So now you don't have that San Diego, California problem. Well, but you still have problem between somebody in New Mexico and somebody in Texas who might be over the boundary line. Um, and so the, the proposal was, let's do broader sharing, send it to the sickest person in the whole region. And what we proved through simulation one of these operations research technologies where we draw random numbers from the computer and we assign people a MELD score and we assign them a which organ is going to come up next. We figured out that if you allocated to the sickest person in the region using these regions, you would actually make the equity problem worse. It would be less fair by geography if you did this kind of broader sharing. And this was the only option on the table for the last 15 years. 
Um, what we, you could think about doing something like concentric circles, and this is what they do for liver, uh, sorry, for lung and heart. Wherever the donor is, you give it to the sickest person within the 500 mile radius. If no one wants it there, you give it to the sickest person in the 100 mile, 1,000 mile radius. We proved also that that is not as good as the system we wanted to design, which is a redistricting model to decide what regions should we have? What should the regional boundaries be so that broader sharing will allow a fair system? All right, so this is what the optimization model looks like. I can take you through the details of that, which is exciting because when I talk to transplant audiences, I just say, here's the math, and then I click to the next slide. All right, so the objective is to make the system as fair as possible. So I've got up there the difference between the number of donors DI that you actually get in a region I designed by my redistricting model, minus PI, and PI is some idea of proportional allocation, which means this is the fairest we could possibly make the system. So that difference is, it has a sensible unit. It's the number of organs that go to the wrong place. All right. Let me go back a couple of slides and just say, what I'm doing is leaving the DSA boundaries in place, but combining them in a different configuration to make different regions. Um, okay, so these WKIs in the very first constraint, those are really the decisions. If WKI is one, it says that the kth DSA goes into the ith region, and if zero, then it doesn't. Uh, so the first constraint says, the sum of the WKIs for every I is one. Is are the regions, right? So that means that first constraint says that every DSA has to go into at least, it has to go into exactly one region. Everybody gets assigned somewhere. The second thing says, how many regions do we want to design? There are 11 in this case. There are 11 right now in the country. And I've been working with the liver committee of the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network in the US. They've decided they want fewer, maybe eight, maybe as few as four. So they're, they're go looking for a, f a few fewer regions, actually. And then the next two, DI and PI, that's just defining how many donors and, and how, much the, how many donors are in the region and how many there should be in the region. And then the last constraint is actually a technical constraint that makes my regions compact. It says, for all of the regions, I'm gonna pick a center and every other DSA is assigned to the region uh, for which center it is closest to. Right. So I don't have an arbitrary notion of this region starts here, but I decide what should be the centers of the regions so that every DSA is attached to its closest region. And so that means that I get regions that are stacked close together. I didn't, wouldn't want to combine places across the country into the same region. All right, so here's an example of a smaller regional map that we designed. This one has, what, six or seven regions? And they're totally different from the original thing. This is very scary for the liver community, but what's really been fundamental is that the mathematics involved give you an objective way to define your plan. You just agree as a community that, hey, we want to make the system as fair as possible. We want to draw eight regions. We want to make sure that the regions are compact. And there are a few other side constraints that they put in there. For instance, they wanted to make sure that there were at least six transplant centers in each of the regions. And that has to do with encouraging competition so that so that none of the organ procurement organizations are gonna like pass on marginal donors, right? It's a way of making sure that every single donor gets captured. So they wanted a minimum number of transplant centers per region. And you could put, you can imagine all kinds of side constraints that you could put in there. And what's really key is it's transparent the way the design is created. But it's not obvious at the, set, at the outset when everyone agrees to sign on to the plan exactly who the winners and losers are gonna be. The reason that since 1998 there's been no change in the system is that liver transplant makes hospitals a lot of money and doing fewer transplants means that you're losing revenue and you know people might lose their jobs, et cetera. So it's been very political. I mean, states hired lobbyists. There were the liver wars in the late 90s over this. But we really think that 
the idea of objectively designing the system where what the transplant community signs on to is the principle, yes, we want this to be fair, and then the system it, it actually designs itself is very attractive to them. So when I first gave this presentation, there was so much excitement and so much buzz. And so we think that this will go to public comment next year, actually, this redistricting plan. But here's an example of why it's effective. I said that if we did regional sharing in the existing regions, things would get worse. So this, di this diagram is showing you how much variation there is in how sick you have to be to get a transplant. So the thing on the very left, which says current, that says that in some DSAs, you might get a transplant at an average of 19, median meld of 19, and in some DSAs, it's up like 27. And actually, now the situation is worse than that. If you did regional sharing, why does it actually get worse? Why is the variation greater? Well, there are some areas, some DSAs, that are doing pretty OK, but they're next to a very populated and very, very badly undersourced area. So that one, play, that one DSA will drag all the other DSAs down into being very difficult places to get access to an organ. And the region lines are drawn in the wrong place to be giving you a fair system across the country. All right, so here's examples of how the maps that we drew would actually shrink the box and make people get organs that are closer to the same meld. Uh, here's another way of describing, we found that actually it's really hard to talk to people about, here's the decrease in variance at mean meld at transplant. They say, what does that mean? So we started to come up with new diagrams. And these are actually the ones that we made for Scientific American, because when we interviewed with the Scientific American people, they said, we can't put this in the magazine. You have to give us like something that is going to make sense to people. So we designed this graphic to show what's the median meld that you get a transplant at different places in the country. And this is the current situation. And those red and pink are places where you really can't get an organ when you need one. Uh, the gray are places where they don't offer liver transplants. So if you live in Texas and you need a liver transplant, you have to go to California. And then here's what would happen under a redistricted system. You see, like many, many fewer people would live in an extreme shortage of livers area. Although, like I said, Los Angeles is still a tough nut to crack. OK. So that's, that's liver allocation. Let, let me go actually back and see if anybody wanted to ask a question about the liver stuff before I start talking about kidney. Yeah, can I ask, um, in your formulation, you didn't have anything that I could see to do with the distance. And so in your redistribution, there could be someone, I don't know, in Montana or whatever was up there in, in San Diego. I didn't have any distance kind of equations to say uh, constraint to travel time or anything like that. Oh, that's great. I'll, I'll go back and show you where those are, if I can figure out which button is going which direction. Okay. So that's the last constraint on this picture. The alphas are saying, who am I closer to? So they say, is DSA I uh, and is DSA J closer to the center that I've chosen for for region I than is K? So these are all these are also a bunch of zeros and ones, and so you see I've got those are triple indexed. So that is for every pairwise comparison, if if um, I becomes the center of that region. Is J, you know, is J or K closer? But closest doesn't mean sufficiently close. So just because it's the best you could do doesn't mean it's, it still could be too far in distance. Ah, yes. Oh, I see your, I see your point. So uh, the, the constraint that I'm pointing to says you want the region to be clumped together without a piece in the middle that's attached to someone else. But your question is, Forget that. If I, if I put the number of regions at one, then I've got the whole country in one place, and it's infeasible. It sh I should be telling you I can't do that at all. So yeah, I would classify that as a side constraint. It's not on my slide. But the liver committee did want to impose that. They said, we can't have the travel be farther than four hours. So I would add that. Yeah, it's a good point. 
but that's exactly the kind of like back and forth that I had to do with them because they weren't able to articulate all of these things as mathematical constraints when we first started talking about that. Instead, and I, see, I love these like sort of tales from the trenches. Instead, we designed some maps. We went in, we presented them, and we presented metrics, and they said, I don't like the way that looks. This, the, there's a problem here. And they hadn't articulated that, of course. Steve Boyd talked about this last night. They, they, they sort of hadn't realized that there was a constraint that we should have added into the formulation. So over the course of, of several iterations, we have a model that they're, they're re everyone's ready to sign on to. So that's really exciting for us. OK. So, yeah. In terms of how you mentioned the fairness of the particular system, you had um, your, your graph there with the, um, the four bars. Ah, yes. Showing the variance of median melded transplant. You were saying the reason why the fully regional system ends up being worse in some sense is because a, partic a particular region drags a number of other ones down with it. Drags a bunch of other ones down, yes. So that, that one region which is dragging the other ones down, it's probably going to be a region which um, has a large number of people in it, right? Yes. And is, this, is there some weighting in terms of me looking at each region, which ones the, are the ones with more people and the more important in some sense? Oh, that's a good question. So you want something like weighted variance? Yeah, um, so that's not shown in this diagram, right? I've got one dot for every DSA, even the small ones. Um, but yeah, so the notion of weighted variance, it should be how many people live in an area where it's hard to get a transplant. And that's sort of what we are able to see in the next piece, sort of, although even this isn't a good diagram because areas are large but have fewer people. But we, for example, you could say that in this map, 28% of the country lives in a place where it's extremely hard to get a liver transplant. And in this map, 6% of the country lives in a place where it's extremely hard to get a liver transplant. Clearer if you're, if you're more familiar with the demographics of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you look at that, you know, at that picture and have a feeling for where, where are most of the people, whereas I don't so much. You know, it, it's something that we struggled with a lot is how do you even define the unfairness of a particular allocation system? You could say, well, since the objective of liver transplant is to prevent people from dying while they're on the waiting list, that what you're really interested in is variance of the waiting list death rate. If, you, if you're on the list here, you have a 60% chance of dying before you get an organ. If you're on the list here, you only have a 12% chance of dying before you get an organ. And that was one of the alternative metrics that we explored. But again, you can't optimize two things. And in fact, I didn't even optimize this, right? I didn't optimize the variance in median meld at transplant. I optimized something totally different, which was the number of organs that get sent to the wrong place. So my optimization model is a huge simplification of what's really going on in liver transplant. The optimization model assumes everybody accepts whatever organ is available. All the organs get delivered on a single day, and all of the people who are sick show up on the same day to be allocated the organs. Well, that's not how it really happens. A person is getting a little bit sicker each day, and then they might get better, and the organ you know, arrives or doesn't. And so what we do is we have a simulation model called the liver simulated allocation model that has all of these details in it. And we have to use our optimized map, take our optimized map, feed it into the simulated allocation model, and use the simulation to tell us whether the metrics that the liver community cares about have been optimized. And so they're not willing to accept the you know, this has the smallest number of organs misdirected objective because it doesn't match reality closely enough. So, yeah. This is like a great microcosm of lots of the problems that we have with an optimization. But here's a totally different situation. This is a problem that my husband, by the way, my husband is my collaborator, his name's Dory, and he brought me the liver transplant problem and also this kidney problem that I'm gonna talk to you about. Uh, he, he showed up one day and said, Summer, we're doing this great thing. It's called paired donation. So living donors give a lot of the kidneys in 
the US. Living donors give about 6,000 or 7,000 kidneys every year. And it's often the case that somebody's willing to give you an organ, but they can't because they're the wrong blood type. So for instance, a blood type O candidate can't get a transplant from a blood type A donor. So here's what you can actually do to get around. You just circumvent the incompatibility. The person in blue wanted to give to the recipient in blue, but they were the wrong blood type. And the person in gray wanted to give to the recipient in gray, but they were the wrong blood type. But if you just have both donors donate and then you swap the pans with the organs in them, both people can get a transplant that's compatible. And so this is just hugely win-win. It's not at all like the liver situation where you have a relatively fixed supply of deceased donor organs and you're trying to say who's going to get them. This is like more pie for everyone. This is not slicing up the pie differently. Every single kidney pair donation you do brings those two new donors into the pool who otherwise weren't willing to donate. But there's an optimization problem in it, which maybe you can already see. But I draw these uh, information, this information in a graph. And so each vertex is an incompatible donor-recipient pair. The donor and the recipient are in the same node. And then I'll draw edges connecting two nodes if the donor from one node can give to the recipient of the second node and the donor of the second node can give to the recipient of the first node. So I'm drawing edges that connect mutually compatible exchange. And notice that it's not transitive, right? It's not true that if uh, the first node can give to the second, the second can give to the third. It's not true that the first and the third are connected. So now I've got a maximum matching problem on this graph. I choose the largest subset of edges so that no two edges touch the same node. Well, no two edges can touch the same node because there's really only one donor there. You can't have them uh, involved in more than one exchange. So although it was easy with four people to see, even, even with you know just 40 people, it's non-trivial to guess or by hand grab the largest matching on that graph. And we were the first people to write a paper describing this as a maximum matching problem on a graph. Uh, in 2005, it was published in JAMA. Uh, that's the Journal of the American Medical Association. And until then, people had completely neglected this graph structure. And the graph structure says you can't make one decision for the two people that are standing in front of you without affecting everybody else who has an incompatible donor in the whole world. Uh, so if you use maximum matching, you'll get the matching in green, and that'll let 14 of these 40 people get transplanted. And if you use something, a bad idea, then you might get as many, as few as 10, which is how many you see in the pink matching. So we wrote software to do maximum matching and donated it to the United Network for Organ Sharing, to the Canadian uh, Blood Services Group that's running this, this uh, registry in Canada. And so they're actually using it. And I think since we started this, they've done a thousand or more paired donations, a thousand or more people who got a transplant who wouldn't have done so without paired donation. And optimization usually, it's a small bump, but it's not completely negligent, ne negligible. It's about 15 to 20% more transplants that you can get using optimization on this graph than you would if you just did it haphazardly, which is how they were doing it sort of before mathematics got involved. This is how they were doing it at Hopkins before we got involved. They, they did have a magnet board where they would slide around the donors and recipients, and that's the long list. That's the nurse coordinator standing behind that list of potential matches. Um, OK, so but the real problem isn't that. The real problem is we have weights. And you want to say some people are more important to get transplanted first than others. For instance, children have a higher score. Or somebody might have a high score there because they are very, very hard to match. They're called highly sensitized. So that they're allergic to almost everybody's antigens. And it's really hard to get them anybody who will match. So we actually want to put weights, say, on the vertices. And one thing that's nice about this is that if you find a maximum weight matching here, you choose the subset of edges where the sum of the vertex weights is the highest, you also always get the highest number of transplants. So I will certainly get 14 here, because there was a matching with 14. And I'll also have been able to favor certain people. 
right? So a maximum vert, there's no conflict between assigning points to the vertices and getting a large number of transplants, but there is a conflict when you put the weights on the edges. This is more like the real situation because the edge weights can reflect one donor being particularly well matched to another. If you find somebody that's a zero antigen match, that kidney's gonna last twice as long in the recipient as it would for anyone else. Well, you can't put that weight on the vertex. It's a property of the exchange. And also properties like travel. If some person lives in Seattle and they have to fly to Florida to get their transplant, well, that's also an inconvenience. And you want to put that, again, it's a property of the exchange, not a property of the vertex. But the problem is that when we assign weights to edges, we do get a conflict with the maximum number of matches. Right? In the worst case, if I assign points badly, I hope I have a worst case. Yeah, here's a worst case. Uh, I may get half as many transplants as I could have. Right? If I do a maximum edge weight matching here, I choose the edge with three points and only two people get transplanted instead of four who could have gotten transplanted. Incidentally, before the mathematics that we wrote uh, were out, there was a real life kidney pair donation exchange that was using a very terrible algorithm, which was a greedy algorithm on this graph. Let's go back. They would take the highest weight edge they could find. And then they would take the next highest weight edge that they could find. The, it wasn't even uh, properly doing a maximum edge weight matching. It was just entirely wrong, right? And they had chosen, in a situation exactly like this, they had chosen the single edge that got two transplants. Instead of choosing available two other edges, it got four transplants. And luckily, they had this like phone conference where the doc doctors were talking to each other and they said, okay, we're gonna go forward, we're gonna do these two transplants. Wait, didn't you have a guy that had that blood type and didn't you have somebody that was this? And they found this solution sort of just in time before they lost those, those other two transplant opportunities. But uh, that, was, that was in the early days. All right, so in the worst case, the, this mu, mu would be the number of edges in a maximum cardinality matching, number of edges that you could get at the best case, and mu EW is the number of edges I get when I use edge weights. So we needed like, actually some idea of a guarantee on how badly are we gonna penalize the number of transplants if we add edge weights, because the edge weights were really important. Um, Here's a, a proof that the ver maximum vertex weight has maximum cardinality. Oh, I might take you through this because this is kind of fun. Why is it true that I can put any weights I want on the vertices and it won't be a conflict with the maximum number of edges? Well, I can take on the left um, any sort of maximum cardinality matching. On the left, I know it has as many edges as the best matching. I can transform it into a maximum vertex weight matching because at every step, I'll find some edge that's in the maximum vertex weight matching that's not in my matching, add it in. Now I will have to throw away exactly one edge. And if you keep doing that, then you'll get to the maximum vertex weight matching and at every step you preserve the number of edges in the matching. So this is no conflict. Uh, but what we proved was a result that had to do with how, what proportion of transplants will you lose by adding edge weights. And you get this number, if you have the largest edge weight being capital B and the smallest edge weight being little b, then you can calculate the edge weight of a maximum edge weight matching and the edge weight of the corresponding maximum cardinality matching if you have all of the best edges in your edge weight matching and all of the worst edges in your maximum cardinality matching. So that's this in inequality, right? This is how many points you get for choosing the largest number of edges if all of those edges are low points. And this is how many points you get for choosing the maximum edge weight matching if every edge in there is the highest value of points. And so then you just divide and you get this ratio, little b over big b, that tells you how many transplants you might lose. And it gives you a guarantee when you set up your edge weighting. And actually, so it does more than that. If I remember that mu ew and mu are integers, then I can set little b and big b to be not equal to each other, 
but capable of guaranteeing that you get exactly a maximum cardinality matching. Right? I won't lose any edges from the maximum number of transplants that I could have gotten, but I'm still able to prefer some edges over others. And so this is a, it's guidance for the transplant community who are sitting around a table saying, how many points are we going to give people for being in the same city? Should we give them 50 points for that or 75 points for that? Uh, and sort of they're, they're mystified by how, how do I weight different factors in an optimization algorithm? And this is the kind of guidance that they need. All right, we should make sure that all of the, and it's kind of intuitive, right? It says all of the edge weights have to be close together in order for edge weighting to not penalize the number of transplants. Right, so I can add an extra two points or an extra three points on here, but I can't add an extra 1,000 points for somebody being a perfect immunologic match unless I'm willing to give up transplants to do it. And that's another uh, lesson that I learned, which is that sort of as a mathematician, I have to take myself out of all of the ethical and medical judgments and say, if what you want is to get as many transplants as possible, then you should set the edge weights this way. If what you mean is this other thing, then we should set the edge weights in a different way. Right? And, and make it clear what role each, each of the groups plays. Of course, this doesn't have to be just two-way. If I transform into a directed graph, and the arrow points from a donor who could give to a recipient in the next node, then I'm looking for a cycle any length cycle maybe, in order to define a maybe a three-way exchange. I give to you, you give to him, and he gives back to my loved one at the end. Or four-way or five-way. And Hopkins had done up to about a six-way. Uh, and it turns out that it's really easy to solve this problem. Well, incidentally, the two-way matching problem is polynomially solvable. It's really easy. The three-way matching problem is really hard. If you are looking for the maximum edge weight when you include all cycles of length two or three, that becomes NP complete. But if you have no limit at all on cycle length, that's polynomially solvable again. If there's no limit on cycle length, you can use something called a top trading cycles algorithm where you just find the highest value closed chain, closed cycle, you transplant those people, and then you find, and then everyone points to someone else. Um, and so that turns out to be really easily, easily solved, but not useful at all, because if you have 16 or 20 people involved in a chain, it will certainly break. And that's because each of those donors might get sick or pregnant or get a new job, or the recipient might get sick, or it might turn out that they're in fact incompatible when you thought they were compatible. So these things are so fragile that you really can't do infinite length cycles. It turns out you need to do length two and three, maybe length two, three, and four, and you'll pretty much get as many transplants as you could possibly get out of this. Uh, but th those problems are really hard to solve. And in fact, like the United, Na uh, United States National Network is just nearing that computational infeasibility boundary. So we're going to have to be back at work on either approximation algorithms or exploiting the special structure of this problem to make the solvers faster and able to handle bigger problems. Uh, here's an example of the solution. You know, I'm using integer programming. There are a few different formulations, but the simplest one would be a cycle formulation. You have one integer variable for every cycle. Use it or don't use it. And oh, it turned out that we actually needed an act of Congress to make this happen, because there was this law that said you can't give an organ to someone for valuable consideration. So is giving somebody an organ of one blood type so you can get an organ of another blood type? Is that like selling your kidney? Well, people weren't really sure. So we didn't have any data about the people who were out there who needed a transplant. So we just made some up, right? We made a virtual family. Uh, because if it, before this pair donation thing started, nobody was even writing down the fact that you came forward and you had an incompatible donor. So we had to figure out who was out there, and we simulated a patient and all of their family members that might be willing to donate to them. And you know, we had to get the blood type for the siblings uh, had to be inherited from the mother and father, et cetera. And then we took them through this virtual donor workup, and we put as many people as we could in the top 
until the number of people who did a direct donation was exactly equal to the number of people who donated last year to a family member before paired donation. And at that time, when this bucket filled up, we asked, how many people are there who haven't found a, a compatible donor? That they did find a donor who's medically eligible, but they're not compatible. Now we knew how many of those were out there, and what their blood types were, and what their antigen sensitivities were. And so we used this to prove that, in fact, there were about maybe 1,000 to 2,000 additional transplants that you could do every year because of paired donation. And that number, that projection, convinced Congress to act and change the law to make paired donation explicitly legal. Uh, so the simulations that we did were really instrumental in actually making this a reality. Um, and of course, it really helped that transplanting someone saves a lot of money. A transplant saves $500,000 because the transplant drugs only cost about 10,000 a year compared with that remember 80,000 or so a year for dialysis. So, you know, everybody sort of wins and maybe that takes me back to the beginning. Uh, this is my collaborator, that's Dory and so I, I have to say thank you to him for bringing this problem and all of the wonderful problems of transplantation into my life. So, thank you. Side of things, the transplantation drugs, is that ongoing? Yes, the immunosuppression that you need to prevent you from rejecting your organ costs about $10,000 a year. One thing that's, you know, again, a very bad misallocation of resources in the U.S. is that remember that Medicare will pay for you for dialysis for as long as you're on it, but after you get a transplant, you're not a Medicare patient any longer. They pay for your immunosuppressive drugs for three years. And if you look at the national data on people losing their transplants, a lot of people lose their transplant at three years when they run out of drug coverage and they can't afford their immunosuppression. So it is just insane that we transplant people with a working kidney and then allow their kidney to fail because we won't cover their immunosuppression. And then they're back on, right, $80,000 a year for dialysis and they're worse off. So, you know, tr kidney transplantation is in the top of that cost effectiveness list. It saves money and it's way better for the patient. Uh, but the, the thing is I got, into or I got into operations research on the belief that once you could prove mathematically that a certain policy was better than another one, that it would happen. But there are some other steps along the way. So, um, back to the liver thing, um, I guess, do the, the capital DI and the capital PI you were using, do they change much over time? I mean, is it possible that you're building regions that are great now but will go haywire later? It's a great question. We don't think so. We don't think that those numbers change quickly. Certainly over a few decades they might. Uh. Although they, those numbers could change quickly, I would say, only if there were a major medical development. For instance, some finding that liver, liver transplant is a bad treatment for a certain disease that would suddenly take a bunch of people off the list and maybe might take more people off the list in some places than on, in others. Uh, barring that, uh, it's unlikely that other things would change drastically enough to mean that you want to redraw the regions. Um, you know, and again, we're not, we actually didn't achieve all of the fairness gains that we wanted to, so, yeah. Uh, it's interesting though, because this is, this is this dynamic process that things are changing. In liver transplant, if you don't get your organ, you die. So in a sense, you're clearing the deck, and within a year, if you changed the allocation system, within a year it would be a fair system. We're having this very difficult argument now about kidneys, because the national board said you must redistrict, and they told that to the kidney committee, and the kidney committee is freaking out because kidneys, 
uh, you can wait around on dialysis. And some places have people who have been waiting for 10 and 12 years for a kidney. Now remember, the kidney goes to the person who's been waiting the longest. If you combine a region where people have been waiting 12 years with a region where people have been waiting three years, no one in this region will get a transplant for the next nine years. The transplant programs in this area will close. Now they don't have a provision for transplant any longer and they'll have to move to California to get a transplant, right? So there are all kinds of very difficult effects with kidney that don't exist for liver. And it's, it's just another example of how you, you can't ever neglect the details. You can't ever say, uh, ah, well, this problem is solved, QED. You know, the, a solution exists. That's almost traffic flow then, isn't it? You need people merging in, you know, one from the 12-year one, one from the three-year one. If you have ideas, we should, we should uh, take them up this weekend because, yeah, that's, that, that's, my, that's my next thing. My next thing is merging lists so that we prevent programs from closing. And again, defining metrics of what's fair. We are going to make people wait longer than they really should. But. Why do you even bother with regions? I mean, got donors and people who need them. I'm, I'm imagining a force directed model where the person who needs their, their kidney is sort of pulling on demand. They're in force directed methods, very much done. They lead to good solutions. I think that's a, that's a great idea. So it would be something that the force diminishes the farther away you are? Yes, because the length of time you have to ship it degrades the quality of the organ by a certain amount. You could absolutely do away with regions. There are many reasons why they don't want to. Uh, I'd say the strongest one is just tradition. But there are also concerns about people who get exceptions to their meld points, and those are determined by the regional boards. So they want to have some notion of not just one national board for exceptions. But uh, so we could do that. And we've been calling that dynamic scoring. Uh, we just have not gone farther down that road. But that's a great idea. I, I like that suggestion. I think you mentioned with a lot of the heart transplants, the concentric models, the concentric circle model, it doesn't work very well? It doesn't work very well for liver. <laughs> well, concentric circles have their own distortions. If you live in a corner, then you, you absorb fewer people into your concentric circle because half of it's the ocean. Uh, and so we did, we did actually compare re optimal redistricting to circle allocation. Now remember also circle allocation ignores what you're trying to do. It's, it's great as a heuristic because it's very simple to, for everyone to understand what's going on, but it doesn't explicitly recognize that there are areas of high need and low need. It just says you're going to be within a thousand miles of somebody. Right? And so it turns out not to work as well as optimal redistricting. So you'd want to try to move this but force directed, yeah, doesn't have that limitation at all. And people like it because there are no boundaries at all. Uh, but it is such a break with tradition that it would be, it would definitely be a harder sell than redistricting at this point. It would have to be national organized. It's, it's the whole, you know, there's this American tradition of not wanting the federal system to control things. <laughs> we, we have to have our own regional board. Even if my region is a different group of people than it was before, I have a region. It would be fascinating to get the numbers on how that helps to this is cost to I mean, <laughs> if you really just want to disturb the pot, this is the I like the way you think. <laughs> Do you know how Australia does this? Ah, that's a good question. I think Australia does not have a national uh, list. There are only regional lists, as I understand it. But Australia does do paired donation. And the distance involved is less of a problem for kidney than it is for liver. In fact, in the US recently, we've started shipping live donor kidneys so that the donor doesn't have to travel. You don't have to travel across country to be a paired donor. You get your transplant by your surgeon that you know in your own hospital, and then they put the kidney on ice and fly it across the country. It's not. It's not revolutionary for deceased donors, but people were really afraid to do it with living donors on the thought that uh, there's a special advantage for being a living donor. A living donor kidney will last twice as long as a deceased donor kidney. And some people thought that's because it's really fast to get the kidney out and back in. 
But it turns out that the advantage has nothing to do with that. The advantage is probably something to do with the, the insult to the organ of the death of the donor. No, insult. It's a real medical <laughs> word. That's what they call it. <laughs> it upset me if I was. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Question, who's the portrait in the background? That's symbolic? I mean, it's William Stewart Halstead. He is the founder of medical residencies. And this, Dory is at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Halstead is their, you know, patron saint, so. Thank you so much. If there are no more questions, please join me in thanking Simon.